understand. Let me share a couple of these thoughts with you tonight. Attributes of this Christian warfare. Here's the first one, and we've been talking about it. It's a spiritual conflict. It's a spiritual conflict. Go over to Ephesians chapter 6, and beginning there in verse 12, we'll work our way tonight through that entire passage. But I want you to notice in verse 12, Paul says this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We are engaged this very night in a spiritual battle. And we need to be mindful of the fact that it's being waged in the spiritual sense. It, it's crafty. It's sneaky. It seeks to hide itself. It, it seeks to, to, to sit back in the shadows of, of humanity and only rear itself in the spiritual sense when it feels it can strike. You know, one of the common tactics that, that those who teach uh, war principles will tell you that, listen, the element of surprise is everything. To be able to spring upon your enemy when they don't expect it, when they don't see it coming, when they don't know it, when they don't understand it, and when they're not prepared for it, gives you a huge advantage, even if you're outnumbered. If we let our guard down and we fail to remember that we are in a spiritual conflict, we allow our adversary, the devil, to sneak up on us and catch us as a people that are unprepared. It is a spiritual conflict that we are wrestling against. Paul highlights it's not against the flesh and blood. Certainly in the spiritual aspect, flesh and blood is sometimes used against us through persecution. But its root cause is that of a spiritual nature. Being led by one who has always stood in opposition to God since his own fall. Satan. The adversary. The devil. He stands opposed not just to God and Christ and the Holy Spirit. He stands opposed to each and every person that would humble themselves and claim Christ as Lord and Savior. That's you. He is very much your spiritual adversary. Let me share with you a second attribute when we talk about Christian warfare. We understand that it's a necessary conflict. And, and that sounds on the surface very odd for me to say. But, but I want you to go over to, to Matthew chapter 6 and go down to verse 24. And our first inkling is, well, no, we don't want it to be necessary. We want it to go away. We want it to end. We want it to be gone. We don't want there to be this spiritual warfare that we have to be engaged in. But I want you to notice what Jesus said. Ours is an existence that takes place in a world that has fallen. R remember that. The, 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 the purity in which God created the world was marred by sin back in, in the Garden of Eden. And so ours is a world that does not resemble the purity in which God uh, created it, in which He brought it into existence. It's been marred. And now through free will, man continues to mar to mark, to cause blemishes through the actions of his sin in the world. And it makes spiritual warfare for us a necessary conflict. Jesus says this, no one can serve two masters. Now, hear him out. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve God in the world. You can't say that your allegiance is to God and all that He represents, yet give acceptance to the world and the things that it is promoting, the things that it is advancing, the things that it wants from us. So ours is a necessary conflict. Remember, it's a spiritual conflict. The world saying, do this, desire this, want that, accept this, and God standing there through His Word, speaking to us, saying, this is what I desire. This is what I want for you. This is the greater good. Remember the destiny that is yours. It's this spiritual conflicts and conflict in which we must decide which master are we going to serve? Who is it that we're going to give our allegiance to? Who is it that we are going to allow to shape us as, as a people? Are we going to allow the world to determine who we are? Or are we going to allow God through his word to determine who we are? 
Again, it's a necessary conflict because we understand that each and every day I have to make the decision. I have to decide whether or not I'm going to choose right or wrong. It's a necessary conflict because I understand that the choices that are presented to me in this world are presented at times in such a way that if I don't give careful consideration to them, I can be led in a direction that takes me everywhere but to God. And so we have to understand that each and every day the decision needs to be made. Where is my loyalty going to lie? With the one who has the power over my very soul? Or with the adversary who is seeking to destroy me as a person of faith? Let me give you a third suggestion. We're talking about Christian attributes of war. A third suggestion is it's a strenuous conflict. There is, I, I grew up in a, a military family, as many of you know. I saw the military from two different angles, from enlisted as well as from the officer standpoint. I saw it from a medical standpoint and, a, and an armored standpoint. I saw a good overlay of what military life is like, living on army bases, being exposed to army men and growing up in that environment. And I can tell you that war is very strenuous. It is taxing. The military uh, has a very specific term for it. They call it battle fatigue. It doesn't mean that a soldier doesn't want to fight. It means that they're worn out. It doesn't mean that that soldier is, is cowering away from his responsibility. He's tired. He's worn out. Battle fatigue begins to take over even the best trained soldiers in the world. It begins to wear upon them where they become in, in, ineffective. Now, I'll suggest in the spiritual sense, the same thing is true for you and I. We go through these moments because our conflict, this spiritual war is strenuous when we encounter this spiritual battle fatigue and we wrestle with, with staying in the fight. And we wrestle with making those good decisions, those right decisions, those godly decisions. And battle fatigue begins to wear upon us and we think about quitting or giving up. I want you to notice how the strenuous aspect of, of our spiritual conflict is presented to us. Go, go over to Philippians chapter 3. And I want you to notice what Paul says here. It's a familiar passage. Paul, in talking to himself and about his life of faith, says this, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now listen to what he says. I, I reach forward. I press toward. Paul is talking about that which is strenuous. He's talking about that, that that isn't just given to him because the world stands in opposition to God and to Christ. And so Paul is relating what you and I can relate to or expressing what you and I have experienced, the fact that there are those moments when we grow weary from pressing on, striving forward, constantly making the effort, constantly in the fight, constantly in the battle. It's hard. It's difficult. We come and we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you go down to the last verse there in verse 58, Paul writing to the church in Corinth says this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. I wonder why. Because the world is always pushing against us and it's strenuous. Immovable. Why? Because the world wants us to move. It wants us to be deterred. It wants us to stop. It doesn't want us to advance the cause of Christ. It certainly doesn't want us as individuals to grow in the spiritual sense and to produce a faith that is rock solid. So Paul says, be immovable. It's strenuous. Always abounding. We keep going. We don't stop. We continue forward. You know this. Wars are won by going forward, not backward. The, 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 the victory always lies ahead of an army, ne never behind it. And the same thing is true for us in the spiritual sense. You consider David when he went up against Goliath. You notice the one thing he didn't do? Turn around and run away. Victory doesn't come when you're running in the opposite direction of the battle. Victory only comes when you face it forward, head on. 
And you do the things that he's talking about here, being steadfast, being immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Knowing that your labor, it's strenuous. Knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There's a, there's a benefit. There is for each and every one of us in the midst of our spiritual warfare, whatever our, our battle may be, th there is the benefit of knowing that if we are steadfast and immovable, if we continue to be a people that abound, that it's not in vain, that it's not just for nothing. That the wonderful opportunity that we have not only to grow as Christians, but to advance the cause of Christ. What a wonderful privilege. What, what a wonderful blessing that we have. I don't know when you became a Christian, what year that might have been, how long you've been serving in the, the Lord's army, but the moment you became a Christian, you entered the battle. You entered the fight, and it's been strenuous ever since you started. But until we're called home or until Jesus returns, we have to be abounding. We have to be immovable. We have to stand strong in this spiritual conflict. Let me give you one more. Let me give you one more. The three that we've talked about might, might look like they should overwhelm us. Uh, I mean, it's, it's spiritual, it's necessary, it's strenuous, and it, it might seem at times like it's just it's, it's too much. But the Bible clearly gives us the understanding that this is a winnable conflict. Now, I'm not talking about winnable through man's wisdom, thinking, oh, yes, we've got superior forces, so we can take this mountain, or we can control this country, or we can win this battle. I'm not talking about it in, in, in that type of sense. I'm talking about it in the spiritual sense, in which it is confirmed to us time and time again that we can be victorious spiritually, regardless of what the world may say. I'll go so far as to point it, point, uh, put it this way, regardless of what the world may think. You know, the world saw the death of Christ as being a victory for it. The adversary saw it as just another great blow against God. We see it as being one of the greatest victor victories ever given to humanity. Uh, upon the crucifixion of Christ and his resurrection hangs absolutely everything we hold dear and believe because he conquered death, you and I can live. We can live. And so we understand that even though it's hard, even though it's difficult, and even though there are those moments when we lose a battle. I, I came across a, a great quote. It says this, never confuse a single defeat with a final defeat. I like it. Never confuse a single defeat with a final defeat. You've heard me say it time and time again. Bear with me. <laughs> you don't get through life undefeated. It, it doesn't happen. We're going to have those moments in which the, the spiritual battle doesn't go our way. It doesn't mean all hope is lost. We're going to have those moments when instead of standing strong and enjoying the victory that is ours, we crumble. We become weak. And we feel heavily upon our soul the weight of losing spiritually. That doesn't mean the war is lost. That doesn't mean all hope is abandoned. This is a winnable conflict. Look over at Romans chapter 5. And I want you to notice, or excuse me, Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 35. Notice what, what Paul is saying. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? It's a, it's a question. He's calling the church there at Rome to, to, to ponder it, to think about it, to, to, to weigh in on the matter. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Now remember his question. Who, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Is it these things? Is it these very real things that we are experiencing as a people of faith? Are these the things that are going to separate us from the love of Christ? The tribulation, the distress, the famine, the nakedness, the peril, the sword, the persecution? Does that break it? Does that cause the war to be lost? 
As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, what things? Well, go back and read verse 35. The world sees that as victory. Yet in all these things, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, persecution, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Did you catch it? It's winnable. I, I didn't say the battle was easy. I certainly wouldn't present it in the sense that it's fun. I'm not negating the hardship, the difficulty, the pain, the sorrow, the anguish that we have experienced. How many of us have beat upon our chest and cried out to God, when is this going to stop? When is this going to go away? I I'm hurting here. We're more than conquerors. Even in the midst of those, those failed encounters, even in the midst of those, those battles that we come up short on, the war is presented in the sense that we are more than conquerors. How? Through Him who loved us. We have the victory because of Christ. Now, the world has produced some great generals. I believe that. The world has produced leaders among leaders who have been able to rally people to, to amazing feats. I, I, I believe that. But none of them can do and have done or will ever do what Jesus Christ has done. We are more than conquerors through Him because of who He is and what He has achieved and what we have. Verse 38, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You remember 2 Corinthians chapter 10? Do you remember 1 Peter chapter 5? Do you remember all those things that we looked at? Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, the principalities, the powers, all those spiritual things aligned against us, fighting against us, Satan seeking to devour us, and yet Paul brings us back to the understanding that, listen, we're more than conquerors. The victory is ours. The world just hasn't realized it yet. The war is winnable because Christ has given us the victory. And so we're steadfast, we're immovable, we're hanging in there, we're not quitting, we're not giving up. You know, I have some regrets as a preacher. I do. August will be 22 years, not a long time for a lot of people who have preached much longer than that. It's a long time for me. And I have some regrets in those 22 years. My, my greatest regret isn't bad sermons. I've preached roughly 2,354 sermons over that time period. And I, some of them were absolute stinkers. I'm telling you, they were bad. So my greatest regret isn't, isn't a bad sermon. My greatest regret as I look back over the years is brothers and sisters who have fallen on the spiritual battlefield. My greatest regret is been to see brothers and sisters wounded so deeply that they quit, that they gave in, they gave up. And, and you can look around th this, this building and you can look at pews that are empty and, and you, you can remember the people that once filled them, but because of a spiritual defeat, they're not with us. Life is hard. It's difficult. It's painful. And the world isn't out there to be our friend, our buddy, and our pal. It's out there to break us down and to cause us to be molded to what it wants and what it desires. And every day that battle rages for us. Who's going to shape me? Who's going to mold me? Who am I going to serve? Where are my loyalties going to be? And from time to time, the Church of Christ suffers casualties. It weighs upon me great. I take it personal. It, it, it just weighs 
upon my heart. I'm thankful for those who are able to rise from those, those ashes of defeat and to be restored and to, be, and to live victorious again. But I grieve for the empty pew. Because my message to those people has always been and needs to be, this is winnable. I'm not saying that defeat doesn't hurt. I'm not saying it doesn't sting. I'm not saying your heart's not broken. Your will hasn't been shattered. But I'm saying it's winnable. Church, that needs to be a message that we keep telling one another. It's winnable. It's not fun. It's not pleasant. It's winnable. And that we as individuals don't need to abandon the cause of Christ and give in because of battle fatigue. I believe in what Paul said in Romans chapter 8. I believe that there is nothing that can cause us to be a people who ought to think or ever begin to develop the understanding that we can be separated spiritually from the love that God has for us, regardless of how bad the battle is. And listen, some of them are just horrific battles spiritually. But nothing can separate us, regardless of how bad it is, from the love of God. We need to get that message out there to brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to do our best to treat and to triage the wounded. My daddy was a medic. They'd put him on a helicopter. They'd fly him to a battle scene. They'd drop him off, and he would triage the injured soldiers. Then he'd radio back, and they'd send back a helicopter, and they'd load him back, and they'd take the injured back to a mass unit. The, the Lord's church needs to be understanding of the fact that there are times when our brothers and sisters around us need to be triaged. We need to stand with them on the field of battle and, and help tend to their wounds and their needs and, and care for them spiritually so that they can be strong, so that they can be victorious, so that they don't quit. We're a communal people. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 27. Now God has placed in the church each member as he sees fit or as he would have it be. We need one another. And so empty pews with souls that are no longer worshiping with us and striving for the cause of Christ should always be unacceptable. The rally cry in the U.S. Armed Forces is we leave no man behind. I believe that's fitting for us. That we ought not to leave any, any individual behind. Well, what then do we do? Here's these attributes that we've looked at. It's spiritual conflict, a necessary conflict, a strenuous conflict. It's a winnable conflict. What then are we to do? Well, let me make this suggestion to you in, in closing. We need to be individuals that, that are wearing the right protection that are making sure that we are availing ourselves of those things that will guarantee and can help guarantee victory for us as a people of faith. Uh, listen, nobody ever runs into battle in shorts and flip-flops. You don't do it. You run with your armor on, with your battle dress on, with your protection on. Now, friends, the same thing is true for you and I as soldiers in the army of the Lord. We don't run into battle unprepared. Go over to Ephesians chapter 6. I told you we would finish this, this passage here. In Ephesians chapter 12, we looked at verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. It's a spiritual battle, war. Then he says this. Because of what is true in verse 12, verse 13 and following is the practical application. It is Paul saying, here's what you need because of verse 12. Here's what is essential if you want to be victorious because of verse 12. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, 
praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. It's our spiritual armor. Now listen, this is going to sound harsh, but I believe it's a reality that Paul is talking about. Are you ready? This is Christian armor. This is an armor that's presented to the world in the way that, hey, just take these things and go on and you'll be fine. This is the armor that the child of God clothes himself with. That's the very audience that Paul is talking to at the church of Ephesus. Those who are blood bought, those who have been added to the church by God himself. Those who have been recreated, redeemed. Those who have been made clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. This is Christian armor. And without it, we'll never be victorious. Not maybe. Not maybe sometimes. Listen to me. Without this spiritual armor, we will never be a victorious people. I will suggest to you verses 13 through 18 are in no shape or form presented by Paul as being a suggestion. If you get around to it, live your life with the readiness of the gospel of Christ. If you get around to it, take up the shield of faith. If you think about it, maybe you might want to put on the helmet of salvation. These are absolutely essential armor that you and I need to have as a people of faith. The battle is great, the war is serious, the weapons, the, the schemes, the wiles, the, 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 the ways in which the devil comes against us are mighty, but God equips us with that which is greater. The saying goes throughout the world that the American military is the best dressed military in the world. Well, I think there's one exception. The Lord's army is the best dressed army in the world. And so we have to give careful consideration. How am I when it comes to the armor of God? How am I doing in clothing myself with these things that I need to have? Am I making sure that I, that I have my, my waist uh, girded with truth? Have I put on that breastplate of righteousness? Are my feet shod with the preparation of the gospel? Do I have the shield of faith? Uh, am I one that has the helmet of salvation? Am I one that is, that is taking the, the, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God? Am I one that is in direct communication each and every day with my commander? through prayer supplication here's what I need here's how the battle's going here's what's taking place this is what the enemy is doing here's how he's advancing this is where I'm feeling weak this is where I need reinforcements this is where I'm praying for relief this is where I believe the victory can come constantly going to God in prayer and making our supplication our request our needs known to him a, a military will never be victorious without a supply chain Eventually you get hungry. Eventually you need your stuff replaced. We have a supply chain that goes right back to God. Why? Because it's a winnable conflict, church. And we're in this spiritual battle. Let me give you one more. Go, go over to 1 Peter chapter 5 again. We looked at verse 8, but I, I want you to go, uh, verse 8 and 9, but I want you to go down to, to verse 10. And if you notice there at the, the bottom of your outline, uh, underneath the, the conclusion, I, I say the reality is, like it or not, we're in a war. I would much rather prefer not to be in a war. I would. But it's simply not an option. When I became a Christian, I was placed in the Lord's army. When I became a Christian, I became an enemy of Satan, one that he was out to devour, one that he was out to get. And so it's a war. I like the words that Peter says here in 1 Peter chapter 5. I want to give you verses 10 and 11. But I want to remind you that we need to be a prepared people. And the truth of the matter is, and has always been, if we don't have the armor of God, we will not survive. 
I would do a great disservice to those who are here tonight who are not New Testament Christians to give you the impression that you can be victorious spiritually and be apart from God and Christ. You can't. Victory comes by way of Christ, and we need to be in Christ. You need to be saved so that you can be clothed with this spiritual armor, or you won't survive. Peter says this in verse 10, But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, it's a spiritual battle. It's strenuous. It's necessary, but it's winnable. After you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Peter says, here's what, he's just talked about the devil and his wiles. He's just talked about the schemes. He's just talked about the fact that he's out to devour us. After all of these things, Peter says, here's my prayer for you as a people who are in the army of the Lord. That God, through Christ, may do these things. Establish, and strengthen, and settle you. And then in verse 11, he says, to him, God. To God be the glory and the dominion forever and ever, so be it. Amen. I like what Peter says here because he ends with the understanding that God is an awesome God that equips his army in a way that only he can. Friend, I'm not saying that the battle that you are in is easy. I, I wish I could take all of your spiritual conflicts and just bring them to, to an end. I can't. But what we can do as the people of faith is continue to encourage each other, to remind each other, and to point each other back to God over and over and over again. Now you listen to me. Don't you dare quit. Don't you dare give in or give up or give out. Listen to me. This is a winnable war. And Christ has made you victorious. Now what can we do to help you? What can we do to strengthen you? What we, can we do to make sure that your pew doesn't become the next empty pew. That you don't lie wounded and defeated on the spiritual battlefield. Friend, the body of Christ stands ready to support you in this war. How can we do that? We're going to be led in our song of invitation tonight. If you are here and you are in need of encouragement, friend, I'll say it again. Let us pray for you. Let us pray with you. If you're here tonight and you realize that you're not clothed with the armor of God and you understand that you need to become a Christian, let us rejoice with you. If you're willing to hear, believe, repent, confess, and to be baptized, God is faithful and just. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. Ephesians 1 and verse 3, that certainly includes the armor of God so that you can stand in this spiritual war. If you need encouragement, let us encourage you. Why don't you come forward as we stand and sing.